Hey team, Dr. Jay Gordy here, and today I'm going to be taking you through a scientific technique, and that is the use of C. elegans as an animal model for the human condition. Now, these are very cool, tiny little nematodes um, that are a couple of cool facts here. One is they're hermaphrodites, and so they produce both sperm and eggs, and they can self-fertilize. Now, that has distinct advantages when we want to breed up pure lines with specific genetic mutations in them that we might have induced through genetic engineering. But because by breeding with themselves, they might remain pure with the genetic mutation that we have put into them. Now, every scientist I've ever met says C. elegans, but there is actually a genus name for it, obviously, and it's C. norodoptus. Um, and I think I got that roughly right, uh, but don't quote me. Nobody ever says the full name. I've even looked for YouTube videos trying to find people saying the full name. Everyone just says C. elegans. Now, this C. elegans here has been genetically engineered because they're actually very easy to genetically engineer, which is one of the benefits of using them as an animal model, to have a fluorescent probe in it so we can see it under the fluorescent microscope, which is really beautiful. Now, what are some of the advantages of the nematode? Well, one advantage is that it's multicellular. So uh, just the, in one of the other videos, I covered the use of yeast as a cell model. And it, uh, it's a fantastic model for things like the cell cycle, which is something evolutionarily conserved across a very wide range of species. And um, it can be studied in single-celled organisms. But more complicated things, um, like how do you organize your body? How does the human body, how do, how do animal bodies organize themselves? Or how does the nervous system work? Or um, how does, uh, uh, yeah, how does development occur? We need a multicellular organism. So one advantage is just to go um, slightly up the evolutionary tree to the nematode. It's still very distant to us. Our common ancestor was probably around a billion years ago. But because they're multicellular, they have muscles, they have nerves. They're much closer, evolutionarily speaking, than yeast. And so we can investigate some of those key things. For example, we could investigate neurodegenerative diseases that affect neurons neurons because they have neurons um, or we can investigate how you organize a body during embryo development so there's a couple of other advantages um, here the doubling time is very fast every 12 hours compared to mice which double in the orders of months humans on the orders of decades c elegans can double every 12 hours so they're a very fast animal model to work with they feed on a coli which is nice and easy they're multicellular and have a nervous system but they're still ethical um, we kind of deem animal experiments on these worms ethical um, for many reasons. Um, they, they are not self-aware. The neuronal complexity is not high enough to have any sort of thoughts or thinking. Um, and perhaps another factor that plays into it is that four out of five animals on the planet are nematodes. And there are millions of nematodes per shovel load of soil. Um, and there are about... 50 billion nematodes per human on the planet and these guys are coming and going all the time and so somehow to me mentally that lowers the ethical burden uh, by doing experiments on these uh, very very simple organisms that have about a thousand cells. Um, and we have simple measures of health, such as speed. We can track them on the agar as they eat the E. coli, and we can look at their speed. And so if we look at a neurodegenerative disease, if the neurons are dying, they slow down. So we have these really nice measures of health. Um, the other thing is they're transparent, and we can look at them completely under a microscope and using some uh, clever little microscopes like phase contrast microscopes, which I will cover in the next video. Um, uh, we can do some amazing discoveries with just a microscope and some C. elegans. So let's jump into that right now. Now, there was a Nobel Prize given out in 2002, and it was to three nematode researchers. Uh, what did they discover? Well, they did some crazy meticulous work. Man, I really feel for the PhD students and postdocs that did some of this research, as well as the, the main big bosses, because it is meticulous. Here's what they did. They watched a um, they watched a C. elegans embryo from a single cell all the way up to adult 
keeping track of each cell over the um, hours and hours and hours. I think it goes up to 450 minutes that they have to watch these as they develop from a single cell to the close to 1,000 cell adult organism. So it's quite easy at the beginning. Here we can see a cell undergoing mitosis, then it undergoes mitosis again, and now there's four cells. Then it gets hard, and they honestly had fantastic microscopes, they had fantastic attention spans, and, and a fantastic method to track these cells pretty much by hand. There was no computers or anything involved here, um, as it grew up into a full adult worm. So what did they find by doing this molecular, uh, meticulous research? They found that a, they saw 1,090 cells to being created during the process every time they looked at the worms. But when they looked at an adult worm, there was only 959 cells. So that left them with the question. All good research has an obvious major question, and that is what happened to the 131 other cells that aren't there in the adult anymore and what they did we can actually probably go back and spot it they noticed these really phase contrast cells appearing in the cycle so the rest of it is relatively smooth and then here you can see the odd very obvious cell and they wondered what was going on with these cells so they watched them very closely and what they found was those cells blebbed into tiny little balls and then disappeared and died right so something was happening to those balls that were bleeding, disappearing, and dying. What they were immediately aware of was, if this happens every single time, it's not a result of toxins, it's not a result of tissue damage, it's not a result of anything. It is programmed. It is intentional. So this is what they discovered, apoptosis. Technically, I think because of the etymology of the word, it should be called apoptosis, and that second P should be silent. But everyone says apoptosis, which is quite funny because almost by definition, it's not popping. It's apopping, right? A means not. Um, so a popping. Um, it kind of makes sense, right? Um, so apoptosis is not popping. It's blebbing. So the cell breaks up into these little balls, and it breaks up into these blebs, and we call these apoptotic bodies, and they can be seen under the microscope. While it's doing this, it sends out signaling molecules to say, hey, I'm undergoing apoptosis, come eat me, come phagocytose me. So other cells, such as macrophages, surrounding the tissue, come over and eat it. This is a very silent, it's a harmless, it's a quiet death, right? That's apoptosis. Necrosis is popping right? It's when the membrane lyses, uh, the membrane breaks down and the cell lyses and its content spews out in an uncontrolled fashion. This is very inflammatory for a number of reasons. One is that there are toxic things inside of cells. There are digestive enzymes that aren't supposed to be exposed to the extracellular environment. DNA can be toxic. There are acidic things like lysosomes that can break down. There's all sorts of things that are inside a cell that shouldn't be outside the cell, and they begin to damage other cells and the extracellular matrix that those cells are sitting in. Another reason is of this thing called a damage-associated molecular pattern. A damage-associated molecular pattern. We call those damps. Now, I'm going to cover this way later in a, in, a, in a video where I cover the immune system, but these damage-associated molecular patterns signal to our immune system that damage is occurring, and so inflammation will start to happen. Our immune system will come in, and the tissue will become inflamed. So necrosis is an inflammatory damaging kind of cell death, whereas apoptosis is a nice, silent, programmed cell death. And it happens to like things during development. Now, uh, during this, they did genetic studies during these three scientists who won the Nobel Prize in 2002. I don't want to give you their names because there's too many scientists out there to learn. Uh, I've given you the famous names, Louis Pasteur, but I'm not going to go into the Sydney and whatnot, um, who researched these worms. So um, one thing they discovered was when they constitutively expressed this protein called BCL2, they inhibited the apoptosis. So you flip 
this gene on, you get this protein, you block the apoptotic pathway. And then they would end up with worms with little extra cells attached to the surface and inside the cell. It wasn't a smooth looking, nice looking worm that can wiggle through the, the media nice and easily. It had like grapes kind of glued onto it and into it because the cells couldn't undergo apoptosis. This helped prove that it was programmed intentional and beneficial the cell death this idea that apoptosis is cell death is an important part of development now there are some cancers out there actually that involve this gene and actually it involves this gene moving rather than mutating translocating rather than changing the the actual code of the gene the gene is moved to a position where it now becomes constitutively on in immune cells and this causes lymphoma so now these cells have a constitutively active gene that inhibits their death so the cells can't die so they divide and divide and divide without ever dying so yet another discovery very uh, important discovery on cell death pathways which is the yin to the cell division pathways that is important both of those are critically important for cancer so you can see how i'm uh, making some of this basic understandings about apoptosis and cell cycle pathways and things like yeast and nematodes ended up with us not having critical knowledge about important human diseases so this was a really fantastic uh, nobel prize using some fantastic techniques now we do this too obviously during development we produce a lot of cells and then we kill them and one of the famous places these happen is in your brain now i have a one-year-old and he probably has several billion more neurons than i do we create more neurons than we kind of need now what happens is the neurons that make successful connections to the correct locations they survive but some neurons may have made aberrant connections or incomplete connections and those ones undergo apoptosis so around about 15 percent of your neurons die in the first two years of your life and then after that there's a very slow gradual age-related um, neuronal death after that. But this is us doing exactly what those nematodes are doing, creating a few too many cells, then those cells undergoing apoptosis to fine-tune um, uh, the organs of the cells to make sure that we have the exact right number and functionality of it.